A few days after the 2016 presidential election, I canceled my subscription to the WWE Network. I didn't do it to make a statement. I didn't do it to vote with my dollar. I did it because my conscience demanded it. The WWE Network is a video streaming service owned by World Wrestling Entertainment, the largest pro wrestling company in the world. For 10 bucks a month, you not only get to watch WWE's monthly pay-per-view events live, you also get access to a massive and ever-growing archive containing decades worth of content from WWE, previously known as the WWF and before that the WWWF, as well as the various other companies and tape libraries WWE has absorbed over the years. There's also some original programming, such as NXT, which showcases developmental talent and is by far the best weekly show the company produces, or at least it was when I stopped watching. So why did I stop watching anyway? I've been a fan of pro wrestling since I was seven years old, and the WWE Network is a wrestling fan's dream. Even if you're like me and you think the mainline WWE product has been pretty awful the last several years, you can drown in classic shows and matches. Watch stuff that you remember from when you were a kid, or discover something that you missed the first time around. For ten bucks a month! Why would any fan of North American pro wrestling ever even think of giving that up? I mean, of course that's the reason. The election of reality show host, fraudster, and alleged sex criminal Donald Trump to the presidency of the United States was a wake-up call for a lot of people in a lot of different areas. One of the many unwelcome realizations it forced me to have was that I could no longer support WWE. There are obvious connections between the two, Trump and the McMahon family who founded and controlled WWE, have had a warm and mutually beneficial relationship for decades. The fourth and fifth editions of WWE's annual flagship event, WrestleMania, were held at Trump Plaza in Atlantic City. Trump himself played a prominent role at WrestleMania 23, as well as making several appearances on WWE TV in the preceding months. In 2013, Trump was inducted into the celebrity wing of the WWE Hall of Fame. The McMahons have donated millions of dollars to Trump's various organizations over the years, including major contributions to Trump supporting super PACs during the 2016 presidential campaign. Linda McMahon, Vince McMahon's wife, was appointed to Trump's cabinet as the head of the Small Business Association, and after the inauguration, the entire McMahon family gathered in the Oval Office to take this photo, looking like a bunch of tourists who won a contest. So yeah, Trump and the McMahons have always been cozy, and it's gross, I've known about it for years, it's never been a secret, but Trump becoming president was like a splash of cold water to the face, or maybe a stiff knife-edge chop to the chest, if you'd prefer I stay within a pro wrestling idiom. Frankly, I'm fine either way. The election of Trump had the effect of forcing many of us to look at things that had been there all along and really see them for the first time. We knew that racism, misogyny, xenophobia, economic inequality, political corruption, and many other problems exemplified by Trump and his associates and supporters existed, but Trump's election made us realize how bad those problems were and how much worse things could get if we didn't start paying attention and fighting back. The ongoing real-life horror show of the Trump administration made me realize something else, too. Admittedly, it's not that important when compared with the long-standing cultural and institutional injustices I was just referencing, but as a wrestling fan, I found it significant. When I looked at Trump, when I saw his bigotry, his egotism, his ignorance, his brazen self-promotion, his compulsive dishonesty, his apparent lack of any genuine moral center, it struck me that he reminded me of someone else. Not really a surprise, his name's in the title. The more you know about WWE Chairman and CEO Vince McMahon, the more his longtime support of Donald Trump makes perfect sense. Like Trump, McMahon went into the family business. 
He bought the company that would eventually become WWE from his father, who had himself taken it over from his father in the 1950s. And like Trump, Vince owed a great deal of his success to unethical, predatory, often legally dubious business practices. When Vince McMahon bought his father's company in 1982, the pro wrestling business in North America was divided into several dozen regional territories. Most of these territories were individually owned and operated, but nearly all of them were members of an organization called the National Wrestling Alliance, the NWA. Promotions that were members of the NWA recognized a single world champion who would tour the country wrestling in the various territories. NWA members also agreed to share talent, and most importantly, to never directly compete with each other. Each NWA promoter operated only within their designated region. From its creation in 1948 up until the early 80s, the NWA was so dominant within the North American wrestling business that even most companies that weren't official members avoided directly competing with the territorial promotions. Such was the case with the company we now know as WWE. It had been an NWA member until the early 1960s and had continued to respect its territorial boundaries since leaving the organization, operating almost exclusively in the northeastern United States. That all changed when Vince McMahon took over. McMahon not only promoted shows outside his traditional home territory, he signed away the most popular wrestlers from other territories, including Hulk Hogan, who was working for Vern Gagne's American Wrestling Association in Minnesota and was already one of the biggest box office attractions in the business thanks to his brief but memorable appearance in Rocky III, and Roddy Piper, who had been a star in NWA territories around the country for years, most recently in the Mid-Atlantic region. But disregarding the boundaries of NWA territories and raiding talent from other companies was just the beginning. In the early years of WWE's expansion from a regional to a national company, McMahon bought out the time slots of territories that had local TV shows, paying TV stations to dump programming produced by the local wrestling company and air WWE programming instead. When wrestling companies started televising events on pay-per-view in the late 80s, McMahon pressured cable companies not to carry events from rival wrestling companies, threatening that any company that offered a non-WWE wrestling show would not be able to air WWE events in the future. The Survivor Series, which became one of WWE's most popular annual events, was originally created in an effort to sabotage Starcade the flagship event of the rival NWA. Oh, and as you might imagine, McMahon is no fan of organized labor. Unlike most other professional athletes, pro wrestlers, even the ones who work for WWE, have no labor union, no collective bargaining representatives. Even in a company as successful as WWE, wrestlers aren't provided with health insurance or retirement benefits. WWE doesn't even consider its wrestlers company employees, instead calling them independent contractors. Independent contractors who have to go where the company tells them to, when the company tells them to, observe the company dress code, do what the company tells them to do, and aren't allowed to wrestle for anyone else without the company's permission as long as they're under contract definitely doesn't sound like an employee to me. So yeah, Vince McMahon owes his success to the same kinds of underhanded practices Donald Trump has been doing or been accused of doing for decades. And if that's where the similarities stopped, that would be bad enough. But there's so much more. Racism has been a part of Donald Trump's public persona from the beginning. In the 1970s, Trump and his father were sued by the federal government for housing discrimination. In the 80s, Trump took out a full-page ad in the New York Times calling for the death penalty for the Central Park Five, young men of color who had been arrested for the brutal sexual assault of a jogger in New York City. Years later, when the five men were exonerated of the crime and released from prison, Trump continued to insist they must have been guilty. Trump's political career began with him tirelessly promoting the racist conspiracy theory that Barack Obama had not been born in the United States. Since assuming the presidency, Trump has made pushing for white supremacist social and economic policies 
a centerpiece of his administration. Fear-mongering about a non-existent invasion of violent Mexican immigrants and repeatedly attempting to implement a ban on Muslims entering the country. Oh, that's pretty bad, but Vince McMahon's record when it comes to race isn't a hell of a lot better. Let's start with this revealing statistic. Of the 71 people who have held a world championship in WWE since Vince McMahon bought the company in 1982, all but 11 have been white. Of the 11 people of color to hold world championships, only two have been black. A quick note to wrestling fans, when I say world championship in WWE, I am referring to the WWF slash WWF slash WWE championship that was created in 1963, the WWE World Championship that was created in 2002, and the WWE Universal Championship that was created in 2016. I am not talking about the WWE version of the ECW Championship, because who are they kidding with that? It's not as if WWE hasn't had opportunities to put a world championship around the waist of a person of color. The list of non-white wrestlers who worked in WWE but never held a world championship there contains some pretty impressive names. Tony Atlas, Rocky Johnson, Junkyard Dog, Ron Simmons, Shelton Benjamin, Bobby Lashley. I'm not saying that all of those men should have been WWE champion, but it's a little surprising that none of them were. To date. That is, Shelton Benjamin and Bobby Lashley are both still active and are both currently under contract with WWE, so you never know. It's not just that McMahon hasn't chosen to put a world championship on more than a relative handful of non-white wrestlers. The way he's chosen to present people of color on his shows over the years has often suggested that he is racially insensitive at best. For example, in the early 80s, a black wrestler named James Harris began working in the Memphis Territory under the name Kamala. The Kamala gimmick, which was developed by Memphis promoters Jerry Lawler and Jerry Jarrett, both of whom are white, was a stereotypical primitive African headhunter. Vince McMahon featured Kamala on WWE programming off and on throughout the 80s and into the early 90s. While it was a somewhat common practice for McMahon to give his wrestlers new gimmicks when they came to work for him, he apparently saw no such need when it came to Kamala, who was allowed to go on WWE TV as is. In the 1990s, Charles Wright had the dubious distinction of working for WWE under three different racially insensitive gimmicks. Voodoo Priest Papa Shango, Kama Mustafa, who was a member of the Nation of Domination, a stable of black separatists, they were the bad guys, and The Godfather, a stereotypical street pimp complete with gold chains, garish ring attire, and an entourage of young women referred to as his hoes. In 2006, WWE introduced a new tag team consisting of JTG and Shad Gaspard, known collectively as Crime Time. They were two young black men who were shown in vignettes training for their WWE debut by robbing people. The Crime Time gimmick was so offensive that WWE felt the need to issue a disclaimer on its website explaining that Crime Time was intended to be a parody of racial stereotypes and an attempt at Saturday Night Live-like humor that was bound to entertain audiences of all ethnic derivations. Yeah, that racist thing we did, which was so racist even we were worried about how racist it was, uh, that was intended to make fun of racism. And people of all races are going to laugh at it. <laughs> all races. They will. <laughs> Brilliant, Vince. That'll definitely take care of it. Declaring that non-white people will think your racist jokes are funny is the best way to convince people you're not a racist. What else does Vince McMahon have in common with Donald Trump? Well, how about the fact that they are both blatant, delusional, seemingly pathological liars? You know that thing Trump does almost every day where he'll say something that everyone knows is completely false and which you would assume he must know is completely false too, but he says it anyway and refuses to correct it even when multiple people call him out on it? Vince McMahon does that too. 
My favorite example is a claim McMahon has made a few times during interviews. Remember how I told you he essentially built his company in the early 80s by luring talent away from other promotions and running his competitors out of business? Despite this, Vince describes his business philosophy this way. In my philosophy of business is help yourself, not hurt the other guy. I think he almost believes it. Like Trump, McMahon is also prone to exaggerating his own accomplishments. WWE Company Line declares that its flagship TV show, Raw, is the longest-running weekly episodic program in the U.S. That's not true. Even if you narrow your consideration to only entertainment programming and leave out shows like 60 Minutes, which has been on for 50 years and produced over 2,000 episodes, the Simpsons has been on the air longer than Raw has, and so have a few of the longest-running reality shows, including The Real World and Cops, both of which I was surprised to learn while researching this video are still in production. McMahon also likes to inflate the number of people who attend WWE events. You know all about that, don't you, Mr. Biggest Inauguration Crowd in History? It's become a part of WWE lore that WrestleMania 3, which was headlined by Hulk Hogan defending what was then called the WWF Championship against Andre the Giant, drew 93,000 people. Except, that's not true. The best guess for the actual number of people who attended WrestleMania 3, according to wrestling journalist Dave Meltzer, is around 78,000. Two years ago, the company pulled the same trick, announcing that live attendance at WrestleMania 32 was over 101,000. According to the local police department, the actual attendance was around 81,000. I mean, if you drew 80,000 people to a show you put on, why would you feel the need to lie and say that there had actually been 100,000 there? 80,000 is nothing to be embarrassed about. That's a hell of a crowd. I mean, unless you're the Pope. I'm pretty sure the Pope wouldn't even go on stage for 80,000 people, but that's got to be the only exception. Finally, Trump and McMahon both have serious, well-established problems with how they treat women. With Trump, there's the Access Hollywood tape, the numerous women who have accused him of sexual assault, the history of creepy behavior at beauty pageants, and the innumerable times he's used sexist and derogatory language to publicly attack women he didn't like. With Vince McMahon, there are the many, many times he's presented women on his TV shows in a degrading way, sometimes appearing alongside himself, like that time he infamously commanded Trish Stratus to bark like a dog. I know, I know, he was the heel. That makes it okay. There's the fact that, as I mentioned in a previous video, despite spending the last few years promoting a so-called women's revolution, later this week, WWE will be holding a major event in Saudi Arabia, where women face more serious oppression than almost anywhere else on Earth, with no women wrestlers scheduled to appear on the show. Oh, and there's the fact that Vince McMahon was accused of rape by a former WWE referee in 1992 and accused of sexual harassment by an employee at a Florida tanning bar in 2006 and wasn't charged in either case. Sexual assault allegations were made in the early 90s against several people who had worked for WWE, and McMahon's response was essentially the same as Trump's response to the assault charges against him. The accusers are lying. Why didn't they tell anyone at the time? Why didn't they go to the police earlier? Why didn't the police charge anyone? Rape is illegal, you know. If you're not a wrestling fan, or even if you are one, you might not have heard these things about Vince McMahon before, but none of it is a secret. All of these things I've been talking about have been public knowledge for years. Vince McMahon is not a nice person. Vince McMahon is not a good person. Like Donald Trump, almost everyone who defends Vince McMahon is someone who has made a lot of money thanks to Vince McMahon. 
People who don't stand to gain from Vince McMahon don't generally go out of their way to praise him, because there's precious little to praise, especially if you don't consider the ability to make a lot of money regardless of how exploitative the means or destructive the consequences to be a praiseworthy attribute, which I don't. I've known all of this about Vince McMahon for years, and I ignored it. I didn't think about it. I looked the other way. And then Donald Trump was elected president of the United States. And I realized I couldn't keep looking the other way. Because looking the other way only helps people like Trump and McMahon make even more money and accumulate even more power. My time and money may not amount to much, but it's more than a couple of soulless, shameless con artists like Donald Trump and Vince McMahon deserve.